this is the last part of Matthew 8 that we didn't get to the other day. Um, we're going through the, the teaching of Christ. Uh, in the very end of Matthew 8, we had the situation of the healing of men possessed of demons in the land of the Gadarenes. Um, I'm not going to go back and, and read all of that right now, um, but let me just comment on it. I think we read it before, but if you have your Bibles, it's uh, Matthew 8, 28 to 34. Um, the Gadarenes is a territory where Gentiles live. <coughs> and uh, there were Jews there too. So we don't know exactly about whom we're speaking here, whether they were Jew or whether they were Gentile. At any rate, there are two people, two men, whether Jew or Gentile, possessed of demons. Demons took over and dominated the personality of an individual. Uh, this is not insanity. This is a real situation. These demons were allowed to do this at this time. Uh, I have no basis, in spite of motion pictures that have been made, of saying that that occurs today. Um, but it did certainly occur at that time. Uh, it obviously gave the Lord an opportunity to show his power. But these demon-possessed people were certainly uh, outcasts of society. If they were Gentiles, they were even more down the line, the rank. Uh, but people shunned them uh, because of the way they behaved. Now these demons spoke out, and we're going to see this again in our study in chapter 9. Uh, they recognized Jesus. You remember the passage in James that says the demons believe and tremble. They were very aware of Christ. And so these demons uh, spoke about, are, are you here to cast us out before the time? And that is so interesting because they were aware of a time. Everything that happens we should understand this. Everything that happens has been ordained by God. There is a plan. There is a purpose that is unfolding. And we're a part of it. Some people try to deny that. But it is true. <clears throat> These demons were aware of it. There is a time coming when we are going to be completely destroyed. What are you doing here, Jesus, tormenting us before the time? That's just fascinating to me. So uh, Jesus cast them out of the two men. And their normal personality returned to them. Their normal ability to function and think and speak and act as, as people. There are two things I believe that we can see from this about Jesus. What are they? Anybody? What, what do you get out of this passage as far as Jesus and the demons are concerned? Well, like you said, he has power. He, yeah, that's exactly right, Herman. He has power over the demonic realm, over the satanic realm. He has power over the devil. As Luther said, the devil is God's devil. We're not talking about what is called dualism, where uh, the devil and God are equal. And preachers who believe that, and there used to be one I can think of in particular uh, in a certain denomination who said, God casts one vote for you and the devil casts one vote for you and you cast the deciding vote. <laughs> oh, yes. <that's, laughs> this is not the case. We need to understand that. Uh, the power of of God over the satanic realm. I remember hearing a, a lecture one time uh, on the sovereignty of God, living near ministries. The power of God over the satanic, the sovereignty of God over the satanic realm. So that's what you see as well. And Vernon's exactly right, right? But Christ here did not destroy 
that he was, he said go. And when he calmed the wind, he didn't destroy the wind or eliminate the wind. He said calm. In other words, God's fallen world remains. It remains. For us to live in and to work on reforming as we reform ourselves. Right. With the full knowledge of God's power over that. That's right. There's one other point. Anybody see it? And I think we can get out of this. I, that's the compassion Jesus had for these two men. That was important for him to cast these demons out and allow them to function normally. Now, we have this interesting situation where the demon said, throw us into the pigs. And he puts these demons he, in, into this herd of swine, of pigs. And they go over the cliff and they are drowned. Now, there is nothing in this passage that tells us exactly why. That's what the, the demons requested, that they be allowed to enter this herd of pigs. But they fall over the cliff, they are drowned, and the people of the village come to Jesus and said, would you mind to please leave? And, and the motivation for Jesus leaving at that point suggests they wanted him to leave because they lost their pigs. That perhaps these were owners of swine. Now, if they were Jews, and they could have been, and I read some, a couple of commentaries, and some of the writers say they, that they might be Jews. Well, if they're Jews, <laughs> then of course the Jews should not have done it. It's against the law of God for Jews to have anything to do with swine. So they were violating the law if they were Jews. Now, if they're Gentiles, of course the Gentiles themselves would be looked down upon. But at any rate, they caused a disruption in their way of life. They were concerned about these people who were possessed by demons. It didn't make any difference to them. They could be out there, you know, separated from society. They were concerned about their loss of income. So this is the perspective I think we can gain. Christ is interested in people and helping people, and he is certainly interested in showing, as Vernon pointed out, the power that he has over the devil and over the demonic realm. And as Roy points out, the, the time hadn't come yet. They knew the time was coming. It is coming when the devil will be destroyed. The book of Revelation says, cast into the lake of fire. Not yet. We still have to deal with evil. All right, let's go to the ninth chapter. And there are some very interesting things there. I think they're well organized. They're organized by the Holy Spirit, of course. But I think we need to appreciate it, Tim. Dude, right at the end there, I'm up, I was trying to pull up, I know the parallel in um, Mark. The, the man wants to go with Jesus. Jesus mm -hmm. says, no, I want you to stay here. And the whole region heard. Right. And, and I think the focus there, the calming of this, the winds, this is the relationship that develops. And because the relationship we have in Jesus, others should be affected. Right. Right. Thank you. There, and Tim points out something that I faced in preparing these lessons. And that is that in the Synoptic Gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they don't always contain exactly the same information. And one will contain something, the other doesn't. So I've had to make a choice. But yes, thank you, Tim, for bringing that up. Uh, we gain insights from all of them. And I will tell you, I'll confess something. I, uh, I use the Calvin's commentary. And he does this commentary on all, all of the synoptics together. So I try to keep that in, in my mind. All right. 9, 1 to 8, and getting into a boat, and this is reading from the ESV, getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city, that's Capernaum, and behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. 
And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. I was thinking as I prepared the, the lesson about when I was a wee little lad, uh, my, I guess my mother, somebody gave me a Bible story book. And I can remember looking at the pictures and everything when I was quite small. And I remember this cutting the hole in the roof and letting the man down through the hole in the roof. Well, this is the, this is the incident. And uh, so the paralytic, he can't walk. He's brought to Jesus, and Jesus saw their faith. There is faith on the part of the people who brought him, and there's got to be faith on the part of the paralytic who allows himself to be brought. So there's faith here, and he sees that. And of course, Jesus always rejoices when he sees faith. But what he says is strange because you would expect that he would just heal the paralytic, but he says to this paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Literally, he says, your sins are dismissed. They are sent away. That's the word, apiavi in Greek. They are dismissed, dimitri in, in Latin. They're sent away. Uh, so that's the forgiving of sins. They are removed from as far as the east is from the west. Some have said, well, he recognized that this paralytic was aware of his sin. That he, of course, we're all sinners, but he was aware. And so he first forgave him of his sin. We don't know. You can't speculate too much. But he said to him, well, the, the sin's away. But the man also needs, obviously, physical healing. He's a paralytic, he cannot walk. So Jesus addressed both, which of course suggests that Jesus is the savior of, of people completely. He's the total savior in every way. But it's interesting to note the scribes. Now as we go through chapter 9, you're going to see that these people, scribes and Pharisees, are always there. By this time, they are aware of Jesus. They are aware of his teaching. And they are out to make a case against him, to gain evidence against him. It's obvious. They want to trip him up. They want to find something that they can say that will bring him down. He has become, in their view, an adversary. They've already got his number, so to speak. They've already identified him. So immediately, these scribes say to themselves, this man is blaspheming. Now, I'm sure they said it sotto voce, under their breath. They said it quietly. I'm not going to say, you know, just talking among themselves. Can't you see them out there? Gathering around, hovering around like vultures. And this man is blasphemy. We've got it. We've got the goods on him now. He's blasphemy. Why is he blasphemy? He didn't have the authority. To In their view, of course not. Only God can forgive sins. And that is right. Only God can forgive sins. So realize this. The case of Jesus, if he is who he claimed to be, he is God in the flesh. If he is not who he claimed to be, he is a blasphemer worthy of death according to the law. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You take the name of God in vain if you call a fellow human being God. And you're putting 
somebody above God. I also have another God before me in my face, and you're saying, Jesus is another God, and there he is. So the, the commandment is broken if Jesus is not who he claimed to be. There is absolutely, as C.S. Lewis said, no room for Jesus the good man, Jesus the good teacher. There is no room for that. He is either who he claimed to be, or he is a liar, or maybe a lunatic. Now, the scribes don't even consider that he is who he claimed to be. So, he's forgiving sin, therefore, he is a blasphemer. Of course, Jesus, as you see in verse 4, he knew their thoughts. And he said, why do you think evil in your thoughts? You're thinking what he is saying without considering his claims. So it was evil from Jesus' point of view. And then he says something very curious in the next verse. What is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? I'm puzzled about that. Neither one is easier. You know, really, I, I can say, take up your bed and walk. I can say to anybody who has a physical problem, you're healed. You can say, your sins are forgiven. Talk is cheap. I think Jesus had in mind something more here, uh, an implication of saying words that have effect. Now, it is much easier to say, your sins are forgiven, because the effect is not seen. You can't see whether sins are sent away or not. That's an invisible thing. So it is more difficult to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, because of the effect. You don't see the effect. He doesn't take up his bed and walk. That's hard to say. Yeah. So I, tell me if I'm wrong, because this makes sense to me. And I, I was following Calvin, Calvin's thought also on this, I think, where he was, and also my other commentary is, is the Lutheran, the name of Linsky. Um, I'd like to read all kinds of commentaries, but two's all I can handle in a week's time as I prepare these lessons, so they're very good, both of them. But the, the how I take up your bed and walk? And then he said in verse 6, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed and go home. So you can know, okay, it's harder to say that and have the effect follow. So I'm going to say it, and the effect followed. And if the effect followed, if the man took up his bed and walked, which he did, then that confirms that which is easier. That which, because you couldn't see the effect of the forgiveness of sins. You all see that? Makes sense? Dave, yeah. is Christ in a way attacking the thought the Jews held that the physical manifestation of the sins, you know, who sinned this man or his, his father, and, and by forgiving the sin first and not having him get off of his litter, kind of disconnected the thought because we're all sinful. Mm -hmm. Whether we show whether we show or not. Or not. Yeah. We're all, and so by doing it in this order he was in a sense attacking that concept. Very, very possible, yes. So uh, the man is forgiven of his sins, picked up his bed of wall. Now what is important after that is the effect it had on the people. I'm sure that the scribes were confused, uh, but they're not finished. They're gonna to continue to try to get evidence against Jesus. They're gonna to continue to follow him around, everywhere he goes. And we'll see that as we go through chapter nine. But it is the people, because that's in verse eight. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid. Here we go again, we've seen this, several times. It's called the terror of the holy. 
It is exactly what Isaiah experienced with his vision in the temple. It is exactly what Peter experienced when he said, Lord, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. Or when the people, the disciples were on the sea and Jesus spoke and the winds and the waves were calm, then they were terrified. The terror of the holy, when you realize that you stand in the very presence of God and when you realize that this individual, this person with whom you have been associated for some time now is God. That's a scary, scary thought. They were terrified. And so now it's the crowds. It's, it's the crowds who are afraid. And they glorified God who had given such authority to men. They were afraid, though. So we, need, we must not miss that. Which means we should have reverence for God and for Christ and for standing in his presence. That's why the communion has holiness attached. That's why we fix the table. Because this is a holy act and because we are communing with Christ. And when we come to his word, it is a part of respecting the holiness of God. Now, Calvin said, <clears throat> They fail to take the final step to see who this man actually is and to see the link between God's majesty and the flesh. And yesterday, as I was thinking over this, I went back over it again. And as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, first of all, Elijah performed miracles, and Elisha performed twice as many miracles, but they weren't divine. They weren't God in the flesh. Why is Calvin saying they should have seen the link? This, the crowd should have gone on beyond that. They, they were afraid, but why didn't they just come out and say, this is God? Well, the difference is, and you know what it is, or the difference between Elijah and Elisha and their miracles and the miracles of Jesus. It's in, exactly in what he did. Elijah and Elisha did not presume to forgive sins. And once Jesus presumes to forgive sins or says that, he puts himself in the place of God. And now he has confirmed that he has the power to forgive sins by raising the, the, this man up like from, from his paralysis. That's why they should have seen the link with Jesus. That's why he's different from Elijah and Elisha at this point. Okay. Any comment? Otherwise, we move ahead because the clock is moving ahead. I've got to watch it. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, if I may. Uh, you may. Talking about how they're terrified. I heard Dr. R.C. Sproul mention the other day. And that, he's very good at that. That uh, people say the church is boring. And, uh, but he said, I've never read it. The Old Testament or the New Testament, where anybody had an encounter with God, and they said God is born. And that's a good point. And, Thanks, Chair. So uh, either God's not meeting with us, or we're not meeting with Him, or something's wrong, or it would not be born if, if God was truly in our presence and made knowledge to He actually is. Absolutely right. And you know, it's the responsibility of all of us who teach, or preach, or lead worship. It's the responsibility that we have to present God to a congregation and to make sure that the people understand you're standing in the presence of the Holy One. That's why it needs to be reverent. It should be joyful, of course. There's this balance. It should be wonderfully joyful. But we need to understand we are in the presence of the Almighty God. It's holy. And no, it's never boring if you understand that. <laughs> it's never boring. Thank you. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came. And they were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. 
And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, now this is Pharisees, okay? And they're not in the house. So they're hovering around like vultures outside. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now get the picture. First of all, Matthew is a tax collector. He is a publican. Publican means he is an employee of a public office, a public company. A public company then was not a company that sold stock. A public company was a private company that collected taxes by contract for the government because the government, the Roman government didn't have an IRS. They didn't do their own tax collecting. <clears throat> they contracted that to private enterprise and these public companies then would hire local people to do their tax collecting. The tax collectors, known as publicani or publicans, <clears throat> the tax collectors had to turn over a certain amount of money per the contract. Their commission was how much more they could collect above and beyond that, and they were very exorbitant in their demands upon the people, and the people hated them intensely. First of all, they hated them because they were, in their view, traitors. They were not patriotic. They betrayed their country by working for a Roman company. And secondly, because they were as greedy as they could be. So publicans were not popular. Jewish publicans were not popular in Judea. And Matthew was one of them. Now here's this man, this publican, sitting at his desk, collecting the taxes, and Jesus simply says, come and follow me. That's all he says. And he got up immediately and followed him. And what do you call that? I call that, yes, Carlos. Uh, well, I was thinking about an earlier question, Jesus is coming founding the Pharisees and the scribes, but he knows they can't understand him. They're not his. But so a lot of his conversations have effect, but they have effect on those that are of Christ. Yes. And Matthew would have been the same thing, would he not? Right. Yes, of course. Jesus knew exactly what he was saying. He made his words carefully. I would call this, though, effectual calling, right? You go through the scriptures and look at every example of when God says to a particular, or Christ says to a particular individual, follow me. How many of them didn't? No, 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 they all didn't. And so when God speaks to our hearts, we will come. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. That's effectual calling. Well, anyway, so Matthew gets up, and the next thing we know, he's throwing a dinner party. Uh, he's celebrating, no doubt, his position with, with Jesus. It, it's in his house, and no Jew is going to go in there. Uh, it, except these are going to be publicans and sinners coming in. They will go in. And the Pharisees are hovering around outside watching this and shocked and upset and saying to Jesus' disciple, why would your disciple go in and eat with publicans and sinners? He is making himself unclean by doing that. This is a violation of the law to associate more a violation of their traditions. But they wouldn't enter the publican's house. But interrogated the disciples. As soon as the disciples come out, they give them the third degree. They quiz them. Why? 
But of course, they're trying to get evidence against Jesus. So what is evident are their scruples, of course. Uh, Calvin calls them hypocrites, sated and intoxicated with a windy confidence in their own righteousness. Yes, they have these scruples. I remember in my days of dealing with legalists, extreme legalists, this gentleman who was the extreme, who was always talking about, I have an objection to that, I have an objection to that, I have an objection. He was always objecting. And I remember one time when he said, I have no objection to that. And I said, wow, here's something that he doesn't object to. Well, that's the legalistic mind, to find something, find something wrong. We're looking for something wrong. But what are they not concerned about? Themselves. Yeah, and they're not concerned about these sinners. People who have needs. Again, no concern about people. And Jesus shows his concern about people. But what is interesting is, uh, at this point, what we call an argument ad hominem where he takes what they said and says, okay, if this is true, if this is true, uh, then if, if, they are, if they are sick people, sick in sin, then they need a physician, don't they? And I'm the physician. And if you're well, then you don't need me. Well, people, I'm the physician who's come to heal those who are sick. And then he says in verse 13, Go learn what this means. Go find out what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That's what God said. That's what our God said, the God you claim to believe in. He said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Go find out what he meant by that. We need to think about that too. Uh, and, and many people are very concerned about scruples and getting it all right and doing everything just in a proper way. But what about the mercy? Where's the mercy? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then finally, another ad hominem argument. He says, for I came to call righteous, not sinners. I mean, I'm sorry. I came not to call righteous, but sinners. Got it back. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's assume you're righteous as you claim to be. You Pharisees. Of course, the Pharisees, you know, it, it, the root word means pure. We are pure. We've got it right. We follow the law. All right? If you are righteous, I haven't come for you. I've come for sinners. And here are these sinners in here. So he turns their argument on its head. Go and learn. Go and learn again the perspective. What is the perspective with Christ? People are important. Mercy is important. Forgiveness of sin is important. Well, let's, let, let, any comment? Yeah, Jerry. It calls uh, Matthew to follow him. Of course, he drops what he's doing and goes. Now, the rich young ruler who asked him, how do I inherit eternal life? He said, well, go and sell what you have and give to the poor come and follow me. So what, uh, did he see that this person is not a genuine, he was not someone that was going to be open for the calling? Or was he, was he looking to see if this, if this young man really had any true repentance? Wonderful question, Jerry. I, his question was the rich young ruler, remember? He came to Jesus, what things shall they do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know, you know the commandments, keep the commandments. And he said, well, I've kept them from my youth up. And then he says, well, then if you've kept them, then go sell what you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And he didn't. He had, he said, you'll have riches in heaven, but he didn't. He turned and walked away. The, Jerry's question is, what was in the man's heart? This is troubling to me because of something that I read. Jesus loved him. And that's why, Jerry, I've always thought that 
he eventually came to Christ because that love would draw him. He went and learned. I think he went and learned. I do. I think so, Tim. I have read somewhere the early church said the rich young ruler was Joseph of Arimathea, possibly. Possibly so. Joseph of Arimathea, he said. Possibly was Joseph of Arimathea. That's a very good question. Um, and of course, people are different. And the way Jesus deals with them is different. But it is always the case that when Jesus calls people, come if they are his sheep, because sheep have sheep ears, <laughs> and hear his call. If he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And these people can hear. Right. How many testimonies have we heard where the first time around, in hindsight, people recognized that that, that didn't stick or I wasn't effectually called. And then after some time maturing in faith, they learned testimonies of people we know in this congregation who will say I came here and I heard Jim preach and then I came and I heard him preach some more and I heard him preach some more and eventually I believed uh, and, and you know who they were you've heard, you've heard the testimony Troy was talking about and yes that's the way God works and that's why the gospel must be preached continually. And that's why what Jim does is so right. Because he never fails to preach the gospel. And that's what people need is the gospel. And, and God calls in, in interesting ways and in different ways. But he calls through the gospel. Well, I thought about doing a little more, but we're running out of time. So I'll give you an assignment uh, for next week. The old and new wineskin. A fascinating one and to the rest to the end of chapter 9 I didn't think we get all the way through I'd rather do it a little more thoroughly so let's pray father thank you for your word thank you for Christ thank you that you loved us enough to send your son and that you've given us this information of his ministry that can speak to us today even though we don't live in Israel and we don't have exactly the same conditions we still have to deal with sin and we have to deal with the world and we have to deal with flesh and we have to deal with the devil and we pray that uh, the gospel may continue to have its course in our lives even as Christians to sanctify us bless us now as we enter into the worship we pray in Christ's name thank you all